Welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. I don't look back on what I was before I came to Christ. I don't look at the things I did, good or bad, the, the, the things that, that I'm proud of or the things I'm ashamed of. All of that's in the past. The key to overcoming the past is to leave the past in the past. Live in the present for the future that is eternal in Christ Jesus. Today on our Walk Down the Calvary Road, we'll continue our series, Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. Pastor Sam is leading us through the entire Bible by overviewing each of the 66 books within. Now, we join Pastor Sam as he finishes the book of Philippians, picking up in chapter 2, verse 14. I was going to just skip over this because I know you're not whiners or complainers or disputers. You never murmur. Well, I know why you're smiling. You're married to someone or friends with someone who does. But you know you don't. But just in case you know someone who does, know this. God does not like murmuring and complaining. In fact, if you want the primer on how not to live the Christian life, 1 Corinthians 10, because he says, here's what happened to them. They all passed through the Red Sea. They were all under the cloud. They all ate the, the manna. They all drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. And he's saying, I don't want you to copy them at all in any way. It's how not to do things the way God intended, but just to do what comes natural. So, so here, here's what I've observed, that complaining, at least for me, comes natural. Now, I never, no one had to sit me down and teach me to murmur or complain. I, I just, hey, that's, I just did it. And, and he says, and he, here's why it's so important that we could become blameless. That means right in the sight of God and harmless. That means, you know, right in our relationships to one another. Children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I've not run in vain or labored in vain. Computing, <laughs> computing, we're all doing that. Complaining, murmuring, they did it constantly. They did it as soon as he delivered them. After the 10th plague and they get out, they end up at the edge of the Red Sea and they're like, how are we gonna get through this? And Moses is like, yeah, it's all good. And then he's like, Lord, what are we going to do? And, and he's like, just hold that staff up and I'll take care of the rest. And, and, but, you know, they, they, they complained because they were hungry and he gave them manna. He complained because they were, they were thirsty and he gave them water from the rock. Later they complained saying, our soul loathes this worthless manner. And I want to say, we all know that complaining and murmuring is wrong. Even if you've never studied the Bible before, even if you're not yet even a Christian, you still know it's wrong. And here's why. You hate when people do it to you. No one wants people murmuring and complaining. In fact, I have this thing going with my grandsons. I had to try to find a way to explain to them how, how you know, well, when they, they start kind of getting dramatic and they don't, they don't do it as much as, well, their dad did. But, but anyway, um, well, he's just an intense personality, let's face it. Anyway, here, here's my point here. We started telling the boys, well, we did it actually with, with Nate and, and Josh earlier, but we started saying when they would get all dramatic and like, oh, you know, everything's falling apart, we'd be like, Hollywood's 500 miles away. Well, with the grandkids, that's too much to absorb. So we just call them Hollywood. We're like, Hollywood? And, and I like it because, you know, if Lou started acting up or Eli started acting up, they'd look at one another and they'd just say, Hollywood. But I've noticed lately that's getting old. It's, it's wearing, right? And this is a generation where it's got to be new. And especially with Lou, because he's the one where if he starts acting up, it's acting. I mean, it really is acting. And so the other day he was getting a little strange and acting up. And I just looked at him and I said, you're fake news. 
And, and he, he stopped in his tracks. Why? He'd never heard that before. I have to admit, confess, it's relatively new to me too. But, uh, but I've noticed that if I say something he's never heard before, in order to think about that and process it, and what he's really trying to do is memorize it, so tomorrow at school or later with his brother, he'll be able to say, you're fake news. So I, I see the wheels turning. He goes from freaking out to completely calm, and he's like, you're fake news, you're fake news. He's trying to memorize it. But the point is, we don't want to be fake news, and we don't want to be Hollywood. And, and we need to just, listen, if we're not calm, and some of us are and some of us aren't, we need to calm down. If, if we're tripping or worried or freaking out, and there are a lot of people doing that right now, by the way, I want to say, it, because most of us tend to lean you know, conservative in most ways, and, and that makes sense since we're in the Bible all the time, there are a lot of people who were seriously affected and impacted right now, worried and tripping, and, and they think the world is coming to an end. It's so important to get this. We are citizens. If you're in Christ, you're a citizen of heaven. And, and there's no politician that's the savior, and there's no politician that's the devil, but there's Jesus, you see. We have him. And, and, and we're citizens, and he'll talk about it, but I'm bringing it to your attention because the election just sort of unhinged a lot of people. There were people worried about what was going to happen, and then people were relaxed and like, wow, I didn't see that happening. And other people are like, that could never happen. And now they're like, oh my gosh, it happened. <laughs> and, and what I'm saying is we need to be compassionate, and we need to look at people who we might think, you know what? Good for you, you, you know, but, but no, they, that isn't the heart of Christ. It's not compassion. It's not mercy. So if the mind that's in us is the mind of Christ, we are going to act like him. We're going to humble ourselves, care more for them than for ourselves, and we're going to focus on the fact that we are citizens of an eternal kingdom. Americans, yes, but... But, and I'm so grateful to live in America. I just am. I've been around the world. The only other country I was ever in where I felt as safe and secure and happy as this one is Israel. Because there's something about being in a country where most people believe in the true and living God. They haven't met Jesus yet, not the majority of them, and they're going to need him because there's no salvation in any other person. But they know that there's a father that created them. And, and so my point is, we are a privileged and blessed people to live in America, but more privileged and more blessed to be citizens of heaven, a kingdom that will never um, come to an end. Well, there's no more complaining, no more Hollywood, no more disputing, no more fake news. And then he just says, after all that, we need to be shining as lights in this world. Later, verse 15, verse 16, holding fast the word of life, that we could rejoice in the day of Christ, he says, and, and having not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, I'm being poured out, verse 17, and that's where we had left off, as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with you all for the same reason that you would be glad and rejoice with me. So Paul says, hey, to live is Christ. And then he says, uh, Jesus is our example. So life in Christ, the example of Christ, now the righteousness of Christ. And chapter three begins and ends, we jump ahead for time's sake, with exhortations Here's some things that, that, that have to change. And here's some things to look out for. And here's some things to make sure you're about. And in between, he gives us his example. So he says, finally, my brethren. That word finally sounds hopeful. But I want to tell you, Paul's a real preacher. And when he says finally, he means, well, we're halfway there. You and I further than that. But finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it's safe. 
Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. The dogs, that was just a word for Gentiles among the Jews, but he's talking to Gentiles here, so I'm not sure exactly where he's going with that. But evil workers, mutilation, that's a reference to uh, those Judaizers who demanded people be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. We looked at it in our last study and the one prior. He says, we are the circumcision. This is how you know. That's the reference to mutilation. Who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, have no confidence in the flesh, Though I might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Here again, he's addressing those who came saying, Jesus is great, the cross is amazing, but you need more, you need circumcision, you need the law. He's saying, here's my background, circumcise the eighth day, stock of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yes, indeed, I count all things but loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as dung as rubbish that I may gain Christ. He's saying all the things that set him apart and set him above, that made him unique and special. He said, I put all that aside. I set it down because as he said to the Corinthians, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And and here's what I jotted to make sure I didn't forget to share it with you. If the works God ordained and required of Israel couldn't justify them, how much less those things that the religions of men have dreamed up or or said, maybe God would be pleased with this or maybe I can do this. What pleases God is that we believe him and then demonstrate we believe him by obedience to him, by faith. By faith, by faith, Hebrews 11, you just got to check it out. Time's sake, I can't go there. Well, he said, I took all these things that were gained to me and I counted them for loss. I just set them aside. I decided they are not the issue for me. And so he says, instead, I, I need this righteousness, not from the law. He had that. He said, according to the law, blameless. But that wasn't enough to make him righteous that could give him salvation. He says, it's through faith in Christ, but that which through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. He's just saying, look, he, he's my life, our life. He's our example. He's our righteousness. And he goes on in verse 12, and this is important to say, not that I'm already there, not that I've already attained, not that I've arrived or I'm perfected. There are those who say that happens in this life. Paul's saying it didn't happen to him. And I don't see anyone else in scripture that ever found themselves perfected The promise of perfection is when we stand before him, we'll be not just with him, but we'll see him as he is and we will be like him. But that's in heaven, you see. Now that I've, not that I've attained or perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus, for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to apprehended, but one thing I do. Forgetting the things which are behind, reaching forward to the things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Hey, don't miss us. Here's a key to overcoming the past. And it's this simple. Don't dwell there. 
Don't live there. You know, you can't run a race. And that's how he describes his life in Christ. Not just walking with Christ, but running a race. He sees the finish line ahead. He is pressing with all that's in him toward that finish line. I got to say, looking back at that time would be disastrous. And that's what he's saying. I don't look back on what I was before I came to Christ. I don't look at the things I did good or bad, the, the, the things that, that I'm proud of or the things I'm ashamed of, all of that's in the past. The key to overcoming the past is to leave the past in the past. Live in the present for the future that is eternal in Christ Jesus. And that's his example to follow. Forget the past, reach forward, press on. Finish strong. Therefore, verse 15, as many of us as mature are mature, have this mind. Here's another exhortation to unity. But this time, he's saying, based on the fact that we are nothing without Christ and we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. If anything you think otherwise, God will reveal this to you nevertheless. To the degree which we have attained already, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Another exhortation to unity of purpose in practice. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. He's saying, find and follow in the footsteps of those who are setting a good example. And listen, they're all around you. And we're all to become those for others, especially those younger than us in Christ. For many walk of whom I've told you often and now tell you weeping, they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. He's saying, find and follow in the footsteps of good examples, but by all means, identify and avoid those who are anything but, because they're enemies of the cross of Christ. And then he makes the point I was drawing attention to earlier, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able to subdue all things to himself. So we're living for him and alive in him. He is our example in all things. He's our righteousness. Finally, he's our joy, our peace, our strength, our hope. He exhorts those striving in the fellowship one more time to be of the same mind in the Lord, to think and act like Jesus. And then look at verse four, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be made known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. Listen, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. This is another one of those nuggets, those age-abiding principles. We spend millions upon millions of dollars trying to deal with anxiety and fear and phobias and and people get therapy and they're medicated and he's giving us a prescription that doesn't come with a money back guarantee you know why it's free i personally like that and i want you to see it he doesn't promise that we'll understand what he's allowed or why we're going through this or why our kids are going through that or why this is happening in our society He promises a peace that surpasses understanding. That's one of the things that trip us up. We want to understand. If I just explain to me what you're doing, Lord, I'd be fine. No, you wouldn't. If you really knew what was coming next, you'd be like, wait, that's worse than this. Yeah, I know. But there's that whole, you know, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
And he might just say, you know, you can't get there from here. I mean, you gotta, there's things that have to happen that, that we just need to accept and embrace, but we don't need to be worried or anxious or fretting or fearful. Just pray. Supplication is, is specific. Thanksgiving, make the request known to God. And he says, he'll give you a peace that will surpass understanding and it'll guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Listen, prayer's available to everyone, everywhere, at all times. And uh, some of us, we pray as a last resort. I think we should think about praying as a first resort. Finally, and he means it this time, finally, brethren, he's gonna give us eight things that we should familiarize ourselves with. He's gonna say, meditate on these eight things. And I want to suggest one way to do that is to do a word study on each of them. This is simple. Either get a concordance. You can start with any dictionary, but a biblical dictionary is better. Get the meaning of these words. Think about how you see them in Jesus. Think about what they would look like in you if, if you were doing these things. He says, whatever things are, here's the first, true Whatever is noble, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report. If there's any virtue, anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. True, noble, just, pure, lovely, of good report, virtuous, praiseworthy. He says, meditate, and it doesn't mean empty your mind and ohm out, as some of us did back in the 60s and 70s, and some are doing today. It's filling your mind with the truth of his word and meditating on how it applies to you and your life. And then he says, the things you've heard, learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. They heard him teach it, but they also saw him do it. And he's saying, do it, and the God of peace will be with you. Well, he goes on finally to say, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that at last your care for me has flourished again, though surely you did care but lacked opportunity. Remember, Paul's in prison. This is one of the churches that supported him, and he never asked for support, and he didn't plead for support, and he never said, I'm going to go out of business if I don't get it. He had everything he needed in prison except freedom, and he used that time in very powerful ways. Writing these letters, they get sent out, people are hearing them, but the Philippians are providing for them. And he says, listen, there's another nugget here, and, and that's why I wanted to make sure I got you to it. Not that I speak in regard to need, for he learned something I'm still trying to learn. Most of us would say the same. I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. Can I say today, in all honesty, I haven't learned that. I'm not always content. I'm not always at peace. I know what he wants for me. I know his plan. But sometimes I forget. Or circumstances or situations overwhelm. There's so many ways it can happen. The point is he said he got that. He learned to be content. And he says, I know how to be abased. I think prison would help there. I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I learned both to be full and to be hungry, to abound and to suffer need. Turns out contentment will never come from getting all we want, but being satisfied with what we have. Then he says, and we need to all take this home, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He promises God's going to supply all their need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. He, he does some personal greetings, but I want you to go home thinking about this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Apart from him, nothing, but I can do all things through Christ. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? No. Paul had learned this through experience, that God can make anything happen, and he can work through anyone. We're so glad that you could join us today on the Calvary Road. Join us again tomorrow as we begin our overview study of Colossians. 
The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico. You can visit our website, ccchico.com, or download the CC Chico app to listen to the entire Jesus from Genesis to Revelation series, or just to connect with us. You can also listen to the Calvary Road podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We hope to hear from you soon. And until next time, may God bless your walk down the Calvary Road. <laughs>